Alrighty, today we're going to be moving on to covalent bonding. But before we do that, let's have a recap on what ionic bonding is. So ionic bond on bonds are formed when a metal cation and a non-metal anion are attracted to each other by their opposite charges. Electrostatic forces of attraction form the ionic bond and keep the cation, which is the positively charged ion, and the anion, the negatively charged ion, together. So for example, if we have magnesium and we have chlorine, magnesium has two uh, valence electrons, chlorine has seven. So in order to achieve the full valence shell, magnesium would need to lose two and chlorine needs to gain one. So magnesium could donate two electrons, but chlorine can only accept one. So there need to be two chlorine atoms so that there are two locations for the magnesium valence electrons to go. So one of them is going to go with one chlorine atom, and there it is, and the other one will be donated to the other chlorine atom, just like that, okay? So now you have a magnesium that has lost two electrons and chlorine that is each, two chlorines that have each gained one electron. So the magnesium, since it has lost two electrons, becomes magnesium two plus. The chlorine, since it has gained one electron, becomes chlorine one minus. Now, we already know that we have one magnesium and two chlorine atoms, so when we make the formula, that needs to account for the fact that there are two chlorine atoms. And so when we do that, it becomes MgCl2. And you can also tell magnesium was two plus and chlorine was one minus, so we know that we need to balance out those charges so that our overall compound is neutral. So if we have two positives, we need two negatives to balance it out, so we get MgCl subscript 2. And that subscript 2 is really important because it indicates that it's just the chlorine that we're talking about, not the whole compound. So it's just two chlorine atoms and one magnesium atom. So naming ionic compounds. When naming traditional ionic compounds, the compound is named metal and then non-metal. The non-metal, the ending to that um, atom becomes IDE or ID. So for example, with magnesium, chlorine, magnesium and chlorine, chlorine's ending, INE, is going to change to IDE, and we get magnesium chloride. Nothing needs to happen with the, the two that um, is actually going to come into effect with what we're doing next, so it just needs to be magnesium chloride. When naming ionic compounds containing transition metals, the charge or oxidation number of the metal needs to be accounted for. So for example, when you have iron and chlorine, iron can have multiple different uh, charges or oxidation numbers, and so we need to indicate for the compound what type of iron was used. Since chlorine we know is a one minus, and there were three of them used, iron must have donated three electrons and become a three plus. So then we know that our iron was iron three plus, which means that we write it as iron three chloride. So the Roman numerals three after the iron is associated with the charge on the iron. It's a three plus. So that's how we name ionic compounds. So what happens though if the electrons aren't given but are instead shared between elements? So ionic bonds occur when electrons from a metal are donated. The metal becomes a cation and a non-metal in turn accepts the electrons. The non-metal becomes an anion. Sometimes, however, electrons are not given and accepted, but rather shared between elements. These types of bonds are called covalent bonds, and they occur between non-metal and non-metal elements. So whenever an, a compound is made by sharing electrons instead of donating or accepting them, it's a covalent bond and occurs between two non-metals. Like ionic bonding, covalent bonding occurs in order to help two elements to gain a full valent shell. This can occur in the form of a single, double, or triple bond, depending on the situation. So let's break that down a little bit. Single bonds. Single bonds are when one electron from each element in the bond is shared with the other, other element. So we're sharing one electron from each element in the compound. So for example, if we have hydrogen, which has one valence electron, and chlorine, which has seven, both of them need, hydrogen needs to gain one electron in order to form uh, its full valence shell of 1s2, 
but chlorine needs to gain one electron in order to gain its full valence shell of eight. So neither of them wants to lose an electron. They both just want to gain one. So they're actually gonna share uh, um, an electron each. So hydrogen will share its one electron with chlorine. Chlorine will share one of its electrons with hydrogen. And so they're kind of gonna share the electrons to make a bond. So then we have a hydrogen and a chlorine and those two electrons, that red electron from hydrogen and this black electron from chlorine are shared to make this bond. So what about double bonds then? Sometimes in order to obtain a full valence shell with the given nonmetal elements, the elements need to form double bonds. This happens when two electrons from each element are shared in bonds. So for example, if we have carbon and oxygen, oxygen atoms have eight, or sorry, six valence electrons, so they need to gain two more electrons in order to gain its full, their full octet. Carbon, on the other hand, only has four electrons, and so it needs to gain another four electrons in, our, in order to gain its full octet. So oxygen is, each of those oxygens are going to share their two lone electrons with two of carbon's electrons to form what we call double bonds. So for example, these two electrons are gonna form a bond, these two electrons are gonna form a bond, and this carbon and the left oxygen form two double bonds. They're each sharing two, sorry, yeah, they form one double bond. They're each sharing two electrons, one, two here and two here to form one, two, it's a double bond. And then over here, these two electrons will form a bond, and these two electrons will form a bond. And so you'll be forming two double bonds. Carbon forms two double bonds with two different oxygens. And so what you wind up with, when those two bond, when these two electrons form a bond, they aren't valence electrons anymore. So oxygen just has um, four valence electrons now. And so it has carbon with two double bonds, a double bond here and a double bond here between the oxygens. And that way carbon has two, four, six, eight electrons, and oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons. This oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons. And all three of those elements then have their full octet, their full valence shell, and they share those electrons together. Triple bonds occur when two elements have to share three electrons in order to obtain their full valence shell. So for example, nitrogen. Nitrogen has five electrons in its valence shell, it needs to gain three electrons. Now nitrogen could share, two atoms of nitrogen could share their three lone electrons and make double bond, or triple bonds with those so that each of them gains their full octet by sharing. So these electrons would form a bond, these electrons would form a bond, and these electrons would form a bond, making, you would have two lone pairs, one here, and one here on the nitrogen, which has how nitrogen likes it, and then one triple bond right here. So that's how we talk about bonding. We have single, double, and triple bonds. Polarity, an issue of fairness and pole. So when two elements share electrons, one element will attract the electrons more strongly than the other due to a higher electronegativity. So like I said, those uh, periodic table trends actually will come in handy when we're talking about uh, bonding. So if one element has a higher electronegativity and has a stronger attraction to the electrons, and so it's going to pull them or attract them more strongly than the other element. The element that attracts the electrons more results in a slight negative charge because it's attracting the electrons more to it. Electrons are negative, so it develops a slight negative charge which means that the element that doesn't attract the electrons as much results in a slight positive charge. This creates what we call a dipole, meaning it has two poles. Uh, when you think of a magnet, it has a south pole and a north pole. Well, when we talk about polarity, we're talking about a positive end and a negative end, or a positive pole and a negative pole. If something is dipole, it is a polar compound, and it has, we call them two dipoles, uh, even though it's just one end and the other end, we call them dipoles. So for example, hydrogen and chlorine, the single bond that we found earlier, 
Hydrogen has an electron affinity of 2.1. Chlorine has one of 2.5. So chlorine is going to attract those electrons more than hydrogen, which means that it's going to have a slight negative charge. That uh, little symbol there that looks like an incomplete eight is called a delta. It's a lowercase delta. Um, it's like a really curvy D or like I said, an incomplete eight. And it means slight or slightly. And so if chlorine is slightly negative, hydrogen is slightly positive. So that's something to kind of keep in mind about polarity is that we can create what we call dipoles and this creates a polar molecule. So when we talk about polarity of bonds, bonds can have different polarities like you saw based on the electronegativity of the elements involved. And this actually dictates what type of bond is gonna be formed. So the polarity of a bond is dependent on the difference between the two electronegativities of the two elements involved. And there are two types of covalent bonds we can have. We can have a polar covalent bond or a non-polar covalent bond. So a polar covalent bond, you can guess, is gonna have a difference, a larger difference in electronegativities, and the nonpolar is going to have not as not as large of a difference in electronegativities because you're not creating that slightly positive end and slightly negative end. So let's look at this. Um, so we have a table here, and this is our a table of the types of bonds, comparing them to the, the electronegativity differences. So for example, if the electronegativity difference between the two um, atoms that are bonding together is between 0 and 0 0.4, it's going to be a nonpolar covalent bond. So something that is pretty much equally sharing the electrons. So for example, Cl2. Two chlorine atoms are going to bond together. They're going to share the electrons equally, which is why it looks like such an equal um, electron cloud. They have the same um, electronegativity because they are the same element. So neither one is going to attract the electrons more or less. For a difference between 0.4 to 2.0, it's gonna be a polar covalent bond. So a polar molecule like HCl, which was the example we showed where hydrogen had a slightly smaller uh, electronegativity than chlorine, and so chlorine attracts more of the electrons than hydrogen. And then if it's electron negativity difference greater than two, greater or equal to two, it's gonna be ionic, an ionic bond. If one of them likes the electrons so much more, it's actually gonna steal the electrons and it's gonna become an ionic bond where one donates and one accepts electrons. So, I have a question to you guys. What type of bond is HF or hydrofluoric acid? So take a minute and open up your books or Google it, find the electronegativities of hydrogen and fluorine and calculate what type of bond it's going to be. So please pause the video and do that now. So when you Googled it or looked it up in a table, you should have found that hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.1 and fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. When you do that math, 4.0 minus 2.1, you get an electronegativity difference of 1.9. This would fall in the 0.4 to 2.0 range and it is a polar covalent bond. It's actually a really polar covalent bond. So that would be an incredibly polar molecule where most of the electrons are attracted to the fluorine and only some of them are attracted to the hydrogen. All right, we're gonna talk about naming covalent bonds in class. So come prepared and understanding what a, co what a covalent bond is, and then we will discuss how to name them and practice some stuff on that. You guys have a great day.